Hello, everybody. Greetings. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm Washington editor at large at The Atlantic. So good to be with all of you this evening, and I'm looking forward to getting all of you in discussion. We've got a great panel uh, in our topic uh, tonight of what drives drug pricing. And before I get to them, I just want to know who in the room is not sort of a major buyer of prescription drugs? Like, who's just here for fun? So you guys are not. So you're here just casually. And, and, and who, who is uh, impacted a lot by prescription drug prices? A few of you. So we've got some stakeholders here. I wanted to kind of you know, put a human face on some of the questions that we're going to be looking at. Because as I look at this question, uh, we, we have you know, essentially a, a question of how healthy is the American ecosystem in health. This is a big political issue right now. There are lots of stakeholders and parts of the uh, debate. And we have a wonderful uh, group here tonight. Just to my left, Gregory Glover is principal at the Pharmaceutical, Pharmaceutical Law Group. We have Anula Jayasuriya, uh, who is a venture partner with ATP Capital. Is that right? No, no. It uh oh, matter. it's fine. No, no, I'm no. We got to get this right because I had two. How about just say we, I'm a venture capitalist? Well, let me just say that she is the uh, started the first VC, as I understand it, in women's uh, entrepreneurship and healthcare, and that, that is one of the markers that you have out there. So thank you so much. We'll make sure we get that right next time. And then we have um, uh, Aaron Kesselheim, who is the uh, an assistant professor associate professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical Center for Bioethics. Thank you all for being here on Great. Now, what, I thought I would start tonight by basically asking uh, Aaron to help take us through this question of what equities we're trying to weigh. What should we top of mind in kind of looking at the ecosystem of drug pricing today? What are we getting right? What are we getting wrong? Sure. Well, I want to first of all say it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm, uh, uh, so as, as uh, Steve said, I'm Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And I do a lot of research on uh, prescription drugs and prescription drug prices. I'm also an internist um, and, uh, and a lawyer. Um, and so thinking about the ecosystem of uh, prescription drugs and what we're talking about here is, I mean, essentially, I think uh, the, the, the really the key issue is that um, high prescription drug prices lead to reduced uh, patient adherence and lead to worse patient outcomes. And um, there have been, uh, you know, there was a, a survey um, that, uh, you know, there's like 25% of people um, in the last year did not fill a prescription because the, the drug cost too much. And for many, you know, many people who depend on medications um, to keep their blood pressure down or to keep their cholesterol in check um, or, you know, or for their, you know, inflammatory diseases, for their cancer, um, you know, not being able to afford their medications um, is a really serious problem. And so, I, I mean, I think that all of us are driven by the need to try to, you know, the, the desire to try to get uh, the right drugs to the right patients at the right time. Um, and, and the cost of the medications is a really important part of that. So I think that what's driving all of these discussions uh, around drug prices is the, the, the fundamental issue that, that drug prices are rising um, in the U.S. out of control, and it's leading to a lot of patients being unable to afford um, the essential medications. So let me, that they let me ask you a quick question about that. And I think it was a very human uh, metaphor that you just put there. Someone can't buy, you know, buy drugs that they need because of the prices. What is determining those prices? Because one of the big debates right now, and I want to get to everyone on this and let's just chat about it, is is it the pharmaceutical firm that's raising the prices? Is it the uh, PBM, the pharmaceutical benefit manager, that, that, that is you know, what they call the labyrinth of the sort of behind the scenes crowds that are driving that price? Sure. Uh, what are some of the other issues? Because I'm just wondering to what degree do we talk about drug pricing and pharmaceutical firms as the front face of a lot of other stuff that we're not seeing? Sure. So uh, drug, drug prices are set by the pharmaceutical manufacturer, period, end of story. Drug prices uh, are, are set in the United States at whatever the market will bear. We have a capitalist economy, and we have a market uh, for prescription drugs. And uh, prescription drug manufacturers have monopolies on their products, and they set prices um, at the level that you might expect a monopolist to set. And the problem is, is that we do not have a very competitive market uh, of buyers. It's a broken market where a lot of buyers are not able to, uh, mm. to negotiate correct prices uh, because they don't know um, what kind of value a drug has or because in some cases they're forced uh, to cover a drug. And that leads to uh, high drug prices. Now, the other issues that you mentioned, the question of to what extent do PBMs um, contribute to inefficient pricing? To what extent do other players in the market contribute to, in, to, to inefficient pricing? Sure, I think there is some contribution there. But at the end of the day, it's the drug company that sets the price and is raising the price. Gregory, do you I agree with it? Uh, go you, ahead, Anula, yes. Does everybody know what a PBM is? Uh, nobody, so PBM, you know. Uh, so I think we should talk about the role of the PBM. Yeah, why don't you, why don't you take us down no, no, that no, road? Okay, <laughs> yeah. so, so PBM stands for Pharmacy Benefit Manager. 
and there are only four big ones. So express grips, so those. Right, McKesson, right. Cardinal, mm -hmm. Um, I'm forgetting somebody else. Yeah, right. uh, uh, Bergen, Bergen Brown Tea, yeah, right? Trust right trust who yes. uh, they all buy each other and become, you know, hyphenated names. Right. Anyway, um, they were in the um, '90s good people because they used to distribute the drugs and have formularies and so forth. And right now, pharma and negotiate, right? And negotiate, they would negotiate right, lower right. prices. But right now, pharma is pointing the finger at them and saying that this middle agent, who previously, and, and I'm not taking a position, I'm just telling you the, how it evolved. Um, that they are now, uh, because of the margin they get, that that is the reason why drug prices are going up. I just want to make sure you knew the terms. Well, I just wanted to, you know, and I want to get to Gregory and see to see if he, you know you, you agree because one of the things I, I love the clarity, uh, Aaron, that you brought to this and basically you know put it right on them because as I've dug in, it's like a rabbit hole where you go deeper and deeper and deeper trying to figure out who has the white hats, who has the black hats. You know, what are PBMs? And then the other issue, which are the insurance companies, where part of the market sensitivity to people buying drugs or feeling as if they're paying more is also the fact that deductibles are going up. So there, this is a complex ecosystem, and I just wanted to put that on the market, that, that those that have been trying to sort of look at this question, as I as a journalist have saying, okay, what lever could you push the most to actually get greater clarity, greater transparency, and greater efficacy, as I know you've written a lot about efficacy, uh, in the sort of drug market and its impact on the health of Americans. But Gregory, I want to uh, get your thoughts and reactions. Sure. So uh, Aaron said that the uh, pharmaceutical companies set price. Obviously, they make the product, they distribute it at least to the wholesalers, so they will set the wholesale price. Who are the price. PBMs? Who are the PBMs? Uh, they will set the wholesale price. The price that the consumer pays, however, is a function of the consumer's insurance. Uh, and so in some cases, uh, you will go in and you will pay a $15 copay, and that's all you really, quote, feel. Uh, but in other cases, there will be a drug that is not covered by your insurer, and you will feel the full brunt of whatever the wholesale price was, plus the markup by the PVM, plus anything else that might be going on in the system. So there, are, there is the price that the pharmaceutical company sets, and then there's the price that you feel. Most of the sensitivity, I think, around this, which is totally justified, mm -hmm. is, the, is the price that the consumer feels. Because sometimes the consumer is feeling a price uh, for some drugs that are six-figure drugs that is more than some families make in a year. And in other cases, it might not be more than you make in a year, but it's enough to cause you to change your lifestyle to decide that you're going to do without something, without a vacation, sometimes without food in order to get your drugs. So that, those are very, very real situations. But in part, I think uh, while we can talk about all sorts of things that we can do to the pharmaceutical company to get them to reduce that initial wholesale price, I think another part of this problem that has to be considered is that we have chosen to pay for these drugs in a way that is perhaps not necessarily the most ideal way anymore. As we choose to pay for drugs and to allow the pharmaceutical company to recover whatever we think they ought to recover by how many times the drug is used. And so if you think about that, we sort of have a problem. Why is it that they get everything that they get recover has to be divided over how many times the drug is used. Because if the drug is not used very much, then obviously the price is going to go up. And one of the things that we'll probably get to later on is how is it that we have decided as, a, as the model that we're going right. to use that that's the best way to do it because it actually benefits, quite frankly, all of us that there are fewer sick people walking around and maybe we should divide it over many other people. That's a different discussion, different political issue, but the sensitivity to the individual arises out of what the individual feels, and part of what the individual feels is the model that we've chosen to Anula? allow the company to pick so, up on that. So um, maybe take it to a different level. Why is it that, and you all know this, um, that the, most of these drugs are innovated in the US and that NIH dollars going to them, the whole story, and they're less expensive in other countries, why does the country? Well, we're going to get to that topic. So, but go ahead. <laughs> is, that a, is that a question you want? Yeah. You want to talk about because we can we can talk about that. Well, I, I will defer to well, my. Well, we don't want to. Okay. I, mean, I, mean, I want to talk about the international situation and you know this sort of disparities. But I want to put but, that in context right. because if we are talking about drug prices in the U.S. 
in a, in a circumscribed space, that's a different story because then it becomes a question of what's the right price. But if there's already a precedent for a different price, then that's a different conversation in my view. Well, when, let, well let's go into that for a moment. How much does the structure and model of the healthcare, I mean, you know, when you, we're having a big healthcare debate in this country on the Affordable Care Act and maybe what com, comes next versus single payer systems in which so much of this is dealt with. And I think it comes down to the question of, are incentives radically different in economies where, say, these same drugs that we're discussing are far cheaper versus the U.S. system where incentives are not necessarily designed, uh, you know, in a, I, I would say not in, a, in the most healthy way or and, efficacious and way. I Aaron go into detail, yeah. but let me say I think our incentives are hopelessly misaligned. Right. Aaron? Well, sure. So um, in the United States, we pay much more per capita for our drugs than any other uh, high-income countries around the world. We pay something over about a, a, over $1,000 um, per capita for our prescription drugs. Um, I think on, in other countries, on average, it's about half that. And, and the reason is, is because in these other countries, they have um, health technology assessment uh, organizations that are uh, affiliated with the government that assess uh, the drug, look at the value that it provides, the efficacy that it provides, um, and uh, decide what the price um, should be, uh, basically, and, and as a result, um, are able to set somewhat lower prices. Now, you know, so for example, that this works particularly well in other countries if there are other drugs um, that work for a particular condition, um, or if the drug doesn't work very well, in which case the other, these other countries can uh, negotiate much lower prices. When a drug is a, you know, a really important um, innovative drug and there are no other options, actually the prices that are paid in other countries aren't too much less um, that, than is paid in the U.S. because, again, the, the company has a monopoly, has a patent, um, and they're able to charge um, whatever they think that they're able to, uh, whatever they think the market uh, is able to bear. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, but that's the difference in, in other countries and how they're able to lower their prices is because they have this system where they have a formal evaluation of the um, effectiveness, uh, cost effectiveness, um, comparative effectiveness of the drug that we just don't have um, in the United States. So doesn't that assume, though, that you have a kind of static, frozen um, provision of certain kinds of drugs, because what's happening in the evolution of drugs is, say, single molecule drugs, simple drugs are, are, are increasingly generic drugs in the United States, and those that are biologics, increasing compounds, the upper end, which are, is about, as I understand it, about 40% uh, of the market today, are, are the areas where competition is growing. And that the United States largely, I mean, there are large multinational firms, but the U.S. research sort of is, is driving that, that development. And if you were to just look, you know, apples and apples and just sort of say, well, at one level, you've got competition along the lines. But, but what, is, what, is your, what does that do to innovation? So, uh, so I'm just sort of looking I think at this. I think this is a very important point mm -hmm. um, because there is not um, a, any relationship between the, the price that a drug uh, is, the cost of a drug, right. or the amount that we spend on drug spending and innovation. I'd really like to try to um, use this opportunity to begin, uh, you know, everybody out here not falling for this myth that there is a relationship between the amount that we spend on, on drug prices and innovation. Um, that, that there is, there are, that, I think that assumes a lot of things. It assumes that, um, that a lot of innovation, that the innovation arises from um, the pharmaceutical uh, companies, and what we've found is that there's a lot of evidence that, that truly transformative drugs emerge from publicly funded sources um, in academic settings, in government laboratories, and then are eventually, mm -hmm. there are eventually partnerships that are formed with companies later in the stage, and then the companies invest as well. So as long as you're making sure that you're still investing those, uh, those dollars through NIH and other publicly so funded sources of, of, of research, so, then you're going to be able to keep, you know, continue to, to, to uh, pr right. uh, provide innovation. I think you also have to take into account the fact that, um, that a lot of the large pharmaceutical companies um, you know, put only about 10 or 15 or 20 percent of their revenues into innovation. And actually, if you're looking at truly innovative, novel drugs, the, the number is much smaller than that. A lot of that money actually goes to um, moving, uh, moving forward uh, and, and making changes to products that right. they already right. have. Right. So right. I think there is not mm -hmm. a relationship I understand between you. you, so you, you yeah, I understand I, the point. I want to come back. The, the, the bigger yeah. issue is should market forces be the right mechanism right. Sure. In, in healthcare? 
And I think that other countries, well, first of all, uh, it was the AMA, I'm a physician, it was the AMA that scuttled the, um, a move to have a single payer system in the US. Right. You may have want it, you may not, but I personally believe that that is the right mechanism, but we won't debate right. that. Um, but um, it was m my industry organization, doctors who, who didn't want the single player system, but that was in the 60s. The world was very, very different then. And one of the issues that we have is that in the US, most of the systems were from the 60s, 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. and, and the world has changed dramatically since then, mm -hmm. so that, that we had, there's a huge mismatch with the infrastructure for reimbursement and mm -hmm. right. the current state of where we are. And we um, seem to always turn back to the market, and the market, it, it, it just doesn't work in, in healthcare. So well, that's my well, problem. It doesn't work in minute, but in I, 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 well, Let me get come to Gregory to react, because I, you know, thank you for that, Anula. But Aaron just said something very provocative, and I don't think, you know, while, while I, you know, uh, you, you are close as, you know, on FDA panels, and that's very close, I would say journalistically, the notion, at least that, that's out there and often reported, is that uh, drug prices and innovation, these questions are tied together. You're saying they're distinct and separate. That's a very yeah. provocative. And, I, and I'm, but, I'm taking yeah. a big risk because right. I'm an investor right. in, you know, and I should be saying something different. Mm -hmm. Right. Gregory. <laughs> so I think it's, uh, it's a complex issue. So complex. to say that there is no relationship between innovation and drug prices is probably wrong. I think what you might want to say is that the innovation, that the relationship is less tight and dynamic or is less tight and directly related as you want. The transformative research does tend to come out of government, mm. but transformative research is not a drug. Uh, for example, transformative research, the ones I can think about are, you know, the statin technology. That came out of, uh, right. of a government lab, but it also came out of a government lab some 20 plus years before we ever had an approved drug. So all that work that goes in thereafter, the government doesn't play anymore. They, they will not play at the level of investment that the pharmaceuticals need to pharmaceutical companies need to play to get the drug to exit the market. So there is, as with any scenario, there is truth to both sides of the story. But to say that we're not, we're, that we can have, you know, drug prices be zero and we're still going to innovate the same way is probably not true. It actually takes a fair amount of, uh, of money to actually get the process through and there's a debate about whether pharmaceutical companies are wasteful or not, but the number is probably, we can get most people to admit that it's probably in the $500 million range. Uh, and there are lots of failures. That mm -hmm. is, these companies have a lot of financial incentive to get it right every single time. Yet nine out of ten drugs that go into humans fail. Uh, and so it's like the movie business: big, big, big hits. You know, pay for yes. Flops. You need you need the very big hits. Sure. You need the blockbuster hits to pay for the others. And indeed, you would like to say, well, we're just not smart enough. But that's really not the issue. There are very smart companies. In fact, I was reading one today mm -hmm. of a drug that I had actually been paying attention to because it was an interesting uh, approach they were taking, and all of a sudden they stopped their clinical trial because it failed. I didn't think that drug was going to fail. I mean, the, the concept sounds good, mm -hmm. but who knows what kind of side effect they ran into. So Thank you. And Aaron, let, let me ask you, I was reading uh, something you, you were uh, interviewed about today. It was very interesting about value, you know, getting greater value pricing models into the system so that we don't have a healthcare system, the provision of drugs, lots of which do not work for people, but nonetheless, they're insurance companies and they are still paying for them, sort of drugs that are not efficacious, and beginning to look at models that do look at the value, the outcomes, uh, and kind of, it, I'm just wondering how far you've thought about that and whether that's a realistic uh, notion for transition to get us into a better place. Sure. Um, I think that that's a really important point. I do want to. I do want to agree with Greg and make an, and make my, uh, uh, also uh, temper or maybe what I what I said earlier by saying, look, I think that drug companies definitely deserve to get a reasonable return on the investments that they make, um, and I think that uh, it is you know it is very costly to bring a drug forward, and it's very cost and a lot of the drug companies do take on a lot of those costs of those um, you know clinical trials that do you know produce a lot of the information about the drugs and the product development, you know, uh, parts of it. And it's also the case that, you know, drug company profits uh, on average are about 21% when the average of the other f Fortune 500 companies is about 7%. It hasn't changed. So, it's still um, that way. I think that, it's, I think that there is a lot, of, a lot of leeway, and I think that I think a, good, uh, a good compromise is what Greg said, whereas, you know, maybe there, there is not a close connection between the two. Um, but but uh, anyway, so on the other point about value, I think that it is, 
extremely important to make sure that we are paying for um, the pharmaceutical products in this country that offer the highest amount of value to patients. And if drugs are not offering value to, and if drugs are not offering um, you know, proper value to patients, then we shouldn't be prescribing them. So if, you know, if a drug is being used, um, if a drug is being uh, used for a, a non-FDA approved purpose and there's no evidence that the drug works, but it's being prescribed widely, then that's wasteful spending. If there are drugs that work exactly the same in the same drug class as a brand name drug and people are using the brand name drug, then that's wasteful spending. And that's money that could be actually being spent on really important new drugs that are very costly that people can't get, like the hepatitis C drugs, which are you know, very, very costly, very, very good, um, but we're not prescribing them to all the patients with hepatitis C in this country because they're so expensive. And so what I think, when I, I think mean, about value. I mean, just to set a scale for those watching is what, about 100,000, between 70 and 100,000 a year? For the hepatitis, hepatitis C hepatitis drugs, C. yeah, about a hundredth of a course of treatment. Um, and so, but they're, what, what they're I, curative, which is really important. Yeah, curative. So, I mean, I think that I think, when I think As of value. As opposed to lifetime right. treatments. So when I think of value, I think of trying to make sure that we are, we are prescribing and patients are taking and we are paying for uh, drugs that, that um, have a have a good uh, you know a good chance that they will work in their patients based on the data um, that that is that is gathered on them. Can I, can I, yeah. So um, I was in pharma in the 90s, and the business model then was to treat as many people and not charge a huge amount, but charge you know mod modest amount, but to make money on the volume. So maybe only 20 to 30 percent actually responded but you treated everybody. Because now we're getting to greater precision So now medicine. it has flipped where mm -hmm. we charge the unit price for the drug is much higher, but the number of people is f far fewer. If you look at the area under the curve though, right. you're pretty much making the same amount of money. It's a different distribution. It's probably better for the patients in terms of efficacy and unclear based on their insurance for their pocketbook and for their economic status. But it, it, pharma shifted that model from treat everybody to treat a few people. Uh, the other thing that, um, since we've been talking about how the innovation pipeline works, um, in, in this, up till the 90s, um, pharmaceutical companies pretty much discovered the drugs in-house. Uh, yes, they had, they had research from NIH, but they did a lot of the development from very early on in-house. And now pharmaceutical companies' uh, forte is in the later stage regulatory approval and the commercialization, and they're buying uh, companies, uh, biotech companies that actually interface with the NIH and with the government research and take it to the next step. Mm -hmm. Again, very big true. changes in the models between from you know zero zero to ninety to, to 1995 from 1995 to 2017. Let me, Greg, before you ask, I want to uh, shift this just just for a second. That as you're looking at the ecosystem of how to get this right, part of what's driven so much interest in this question are these you know poster children of bad behavior. So Martin Shkreli and 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 uh, I guess Turing Pharmaceuticals. Uh, he, someone put Heather Bresch and, and, and Mylon in that mm -hmm. category. Mm -hmm. I think you could debate Heather Bresch has also been out there saying, hey, it's not just us. Lily's been saying the same thing, it's not us. <laughs> it's the PBMs, it's the insurance companies, it's the ecosystem. And you've got to look more broadly at that system and figuring out how to get it right. I just want to ask you, you know, given these scandals, scandalous things that had popped up, uh, but also just the broad nature. Some people look at this industry as one just filled with crony capitalism. As, as, as someone said the other day, I was interviewing Congressman Peter Welch, and someone said, the, the, the incentives are misaligned, but there's too much incentives for bad behavior uh, in it. How would you change it? How would you change, make property rights, the intellectual property rights, innovation, generics, and getting what Donald Trump says he wants to get you know, drug prices down. And he sat down with Elijah Cummings and with Peter Welch and said, let's work together to try and get it down. There's a remarkable <laughs> meeting between different <laughs> sorts of characters in this, right? How would you change things? So uh, misalignment is a term we've actually, you've been mentioning today, and I think that's right. The science moves faster than the legislation. Mm -hmm. and, and just to give you an example Good of point. that, uh, between 1938 and 1962, you did not have to demonstrate your drug was effective before you put it on the market in the U.S. In really? 1960, yes. Mm -hmm. In 1962, we decided that before you put the drug on the market, you had to prove that it was both safe and effective. Mm -hmm. 1962. So what does that create? 
it creates some anomalies. Anomaly number one is part of the patent time that the innovator had was being eroded because they had to do the clinical studies. But the other anomaly was when that patent expired, the only way for a, quote, generic to get on the market was to go back and do all the things that the innovator had done. Right. And it took us 22 years to fix that. But we knew the problem. Right. We knew the problem was early on, but it took 22 years to get the legislation to flip that. So this was the hatch waxman this, yes. this is hatch waxman And let's talk, say why that was done, because... Well, it was, it was done because there were, you couldn't get a generic on the market. The innovators were effectively uh, getting an extension of their patent term well beyond what at the time was 17 right. years from grant. Uh, and, and the market did not have any low cost, uh, well, it, it, it basically was not allowing people to get onto the market with the exact same molecule, which you can prove very easy with a small molecule, when the innovator no longer had a patent. So let, let's just say, a small molecule is a chemical drug, and it doesn't apply to antibodies and large molecule bio, you know, um, biological, biological yes. drugs. Like, right. ethi like uh, erythropoietin or mm. humi humira, right. those things and, are big and drugs. In, Go back to that time; those didn't exist, so right. the world was simpler, <laughs> and so the generic legislation looked at chemical entities. Right. So, and so that's our past. But part of the question is, given where we are today, yes. are, is that system anachronistic? Is it still working? Yes, what, all are, our what, systems is, are what is out of balance? I, I mean, we're in a of, we're in a situation where a lot of people of feel are, are, is crappy and not aligned right. Well, what needs to be fixed? Okay. So, what needs to be fixed is in part what what we care about. So, what we care about. If I'm putting a new drug on the market, I'm going to go for a small indication for something that's very serious, mm -hmm. like cancer, because I'm going to get on the market quicker, and I can charge more for it. Even though you might only have three months of life extension. That's right. And, and, and that is a, that's a different social and philosophical issue, which is how much are we willing to pay as a society to get three months more of life expectancy on that a particular program, cancer. At 8.30 p.m. <laughs> uh, not, but that is, you know, that is an issue that actually came right. up today in the personalized medicine uh, presentation that was in that was downtown. So, so you got yes, we are all we are all misaligned because mm -hmm. Congress is slower than the science. If you put out a new statute, I'm going to survey as a company. I'm going to survey what uh, molecules are available that I can put my investment into, and I'll say, well. If I, based on this new statute they put out, if I do this, I'm going to get more benefit than if I do that. So mm -hmm. what I'm going to do? I'm going to do that. And so then all of a sudden we look at this five years later and say, oh, we have too much activity over there. But no, Congress does not yet have the willpower to change it. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to go on for a while. Uh, and then there are going to be other things in terms of what I want to develop that's going to, that they haven't thought about. So one of the things, I do want to just touch on the EpiPen issue. So the EpiPen issue is a function of it being a drug and a device, a function of it being a combination. For combination products, I'm sorry, for any generic drug product by itself, the drug has to be the same as what the innovator made. And once you get that done, you're, you're deemed to be AD rated and you're the same. So I think, you, I think it would be nice to say that all you have to show is bioequivalence. It's just a technical term, but it's a lot less work than what the originator right. had to do. Mm -hmm. So it's the same drug and basically the blood levels look the same. When it's a drug and device combination, the theory is the same. That is, the drug device combination that the innovator made has to be, and the, the generic wants to make, has to be the same as what the innovator made. But therein is the problem. Because the same for this device now is that it operates in the same way, same mechanism, same look and feel, so that the patient does not have to be re-educated from the innovator to the generic. That's the whole theory about, about, about generics. Well, all of a sudden, you've got a problem there because it's not that I can't make epinephrine. Everybody can make that. That was old when right. I was in, in med school. But uh, I can't really get the device to work the same. And it's not, just, it's not just myelin, it's not just epinephrine. There are other things in the marketplace that work that way. For example, metered dose inhalers. Right, asthma, right. in asthma. Right. Where right. The, the device itself is very important for the efficacy of the drug because if it gives you a different kind of flow rate or plume for the drug, it won't get as far down into mm -hmm. your lungs, will not work as well. So this drug device thing becomes an so, issue. So may I just yes, add please, something? Just, just, just shorter so, form, though. Yes. Yeah. So, so the issue is 
that the drug has a fast way for the person who's a generic maker to make it, mm -hmm. a very expedited pathway. There is no equivalent for the device that delivers it. The device, the person who makes a generic has to spend so lots of money. So that gives them monopoly power? So the, the, it's, there's no incentive mm. for, the, for the generic maker to invest in making the device mm. because they're, it's like they're making a brand new device and they're putting an old drug in there. It do, it's not worth it. Right, they can make it, it's just not it's cheap. Not, it, it's not that they can't make it, it's yeah. just not worth the money. There's an expedited pathway for the, the chemical but no such pathway for the device, be it the injector or the inhaler. Aaron, you're an ethicist as well as a doctor and a lawyer, and I'm interested in how you trade these equities off in something that's smarter than we're doing now. I was intrigued, I was just reading about this, um, I guess a muscular dystrophy uh, related uh, uh, therapy that, that came on, and you were in the FDA, FDA advisory committee that voted against it, not because of the efficacy of it, but you, I think. No, because of the efficacy. Well, well oh, both the efficacy, but I think it was also the price. And I, I no, love no, what you price, said. The price is that said after. Yeah. But you said something I thought was quite profound, which is here was a very, very well meaning advocacy group trying to work for a small class of people that had this ailment uh, and needed a response. A drug comes on and it's you know a million dollars uh, for treatment, which was just beyond, and so it created a battle with insurance companies. I was interested in right. your take on that because it did seem to me that you captured a broader part of the equation than just a drug and and therapy, and that you were raising these other parts of the equation. What's a healthy way to frame this? I mean, we're you know yeah. I, I love this discussion we're having, but if I were sitting out in the audience, I'd say, God, it's so confusing. How can I make sense of it when there are just so many strings that you can pull? And, and I guess, you know, I was gonna open this today saying, why is this so hard? What is so hard about getting, you know, tweaking the system we have to get to a healthier place? So I just wanna ask you the same question. How do you get the equities right? Okay, well, a lot of questions in there. No, just um, one big one. The one, okay, yeah. one big one. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, uh, in the United States, um, you know, just because a drug gets on the market doesn't mean it gets to patients. Mm -hmm. it, that's, and that's because uh, drugs are priced um, at extremely high levels, uh, far more than patients can afford, and because of the, uh, there's a, you know, this growth in high deductible health plans um, and other things. And you know, by the way, if you do have a good health plan and, and you do only pay a $15 copay, that isn't all the drug costs. There is still an enormous amount of cost that the, um, that the insurance company pays, and that cost is then subsequently translated into the premiums uh, mm -hmm. for the insurance company um, in the following year. So that's really not, uh, not, the, full, not the full story. But I mean, I, I mean, I think for me, it's all about how much the drug works. And, and if a drug works, and, and a drug uh, you know, works particularly for patients um, in, a, in a very difficult pla place who have unmet medical need um, or have a serious medical condition, um, then we should try to find a way uh, to pay for it. And the way that we should try to, and we should try to find a way to make sure that the, that the drug company that invested in it gets an appropriate return. And the way that we do that is, is by not paying for uh, drugs that don't work and drugs that um, are, are, you know, do not offer uh, substantial benefits over what's already on the market. And the problem is in the United States is that we do not do enough studies, enough research to, sh to understand and to know which drug is the most valuable and which drugs work. Unfortunately, too many drugs get on the market because they are shown to change a laboratory value or because they are shown to um, you know, change a, 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 an x-ray, right? Patients don't want their laboratory values changed or their x-rays changed. They want their symptoms resolved. They want to live longer. And these are the ways that we should be testing and evaluating drugs to know how well they work. And unfortunately, um, it the, with, in, the, in recent years, there has been an increasingly permissive um, approach to these kinds of endpoints and these allowing of these surrogate measures to be used to show that, to show um, to, before drugs get on the market. And then when you get on the market, then because the drug is protected by a monopoly, the drug company sets the price at whatever the market will bear. And so you get this situation as, as, in, the, uh, as in the muscular dystrophy case where a drug uh, is approved despite the fact that um, it, doesn't, it isn't shown to work and then the drug company sets a, a very high price. And, and so unfortunately that puts patients um, in a very difficult situation. They don't know whether or not they're supposed to use the drug, they don't know how they're supposed to use the drug, and they're not able to afford the drug. And so um, for me, it's, it's all about trying to, 
show what a drug can do, show that it works, and then working so that we can pay for the drugs that do work. Gregory? So, um, a couple things. I, we should not walk away from this evening thinking that uh, all of the drug pricing problem is a result of innovators. Uh, because we now have a market in the United States that's more than 80% generic, mm -hmm. and we still have a drug pricing problem. Uh, so, when we do know that generic drug prices have been going up higher than the, uh, the average inflation rate. So, mm -hmm. there is but some... But the FDA has been raising the bar for generics, that's to right. be fair. To, a, a little bit. The bar is raised a little bit. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, uh, but on the other hand, the issue of value, I don't disagree with Aaron, with Aaron at all, because Drugs that don't work shouldn't be on the market, but let's discuss more clearly what that means because that part of this is a judgment as to whether a drug works or not. So if I But isn't I there data that can help you? There's usually not yeah. enough data. That is, the drugs, so if I'm, uh, if I'm working, if there's a new, a new field, a new target that has been identified, five or six drug companies are gonna go start working on it. And they're gonna get, they're gonna be at a different sequence. They might be a year apart getting approved, but they, and they all will have some difference in terms of side effect or something of that, that, of that nature. That's how you get multiple drugs in a class on a market. Classic examples are statins. Lipitor, which many people believe was the best statin, was not the first statin. It was like two or three down the road. And indeed, there was a lot of debate in the company about should we continue to pursue Lipitor because there are these other people out there. And it turns out Lipitor was actually the home run because it was the best drug. And indeed, just as a side of point to, to show you how much people care about this, Warner Lambert made Lipitor. Warner Lambert no longer exists. Why? Because Pfizer bought Warner Lambert and basically sold everything else because they wanted Lipitor. That's how valuable it was. But, but Craig, let me just ask you, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, sure. but, the, but I, I have spent time with the big pharma companies, the biologic companies, the biosimilar companies, the generic companies, they all want to be differentiated. And almost all of them were, have been talking about or a willingness in this new, what was the Obamacare environment to look at value-based uh, uh, modeling, value in outcomes, because that's where the whole health ecosystem was trying to go, which was looking at health outcomes, wellness programs, you know, sort of ending, if you will, the heavy reliance on brick and mortar beds and whatnot, beginning to move to, towards a different, now maybe I'm mischaracterizing that, that moment, but, but broadly I saw a, a, a real willingness in all the pockets of the drug manufacturing industry in that, but you're saying it's a bad, it would be a bad track. No, it's not a bad track, it's just a hard track, because I totally agree with Aaron that if we know a drug doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera, the question is how do you know? Right. And getting that data has always been a difficult issue. It may not be impossible, and I don't think we should ever think that it's impossible, but getting the data is different. So the value-based contracting, which is what it's being termed these days and might be in right. the, uh, the president's executive order on drug pricing, uh, is fine as long as you can get the information on you the value. You think it will be in there? Uh, well, the, the, things that are being no. rumored, yeah. the things that are being rumored to be in the executive uh. order are things that are actually friendly to pharma. Yeah. Uh, and Even though he's not, been bashing pharma. Yes. And do not give me a clear sense of how that's going to get the prices down. It doesn't down. seem that way right, right. now. But we'll but see. To what you're Anula? saying, so to, to reinforce what you're saying, some effects of whether something works is going to be 10, 15, 20 years out. And so we use what we call surrogate endpoints which are changes of blood levels of various um, metabolites as a proxy mm -hmm. for the final effect. So for example, you know about cholesterol, well bad, if everyone tells you lower your bad cholesterol. So we had this great drug, CETP, that lowered bad cholesterol and everyone was excited about it. It turned out that it didn't change your cardiac health. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought that? We'd been, been told to lower bad, uh, bad cholesterol forever. So that's the kind of thing where in these long-term contracts, right. it would have been possible to follow them out for a longer period on the drug and then adjust, right? But right now we're going out with the drug before we know what the long-term effects are, and the, I don't know that there's mm -hmm. going to be a mechanism like in the previous mm -hmm. um, iteration where there was that mechanism. Aaron? Yeah, it's a fundamental problem. We're approving too many drugs on the basis of these surrogate mo me measures without knowing whether or not the drugs actually work. And then the um, ability of the FDA to uh, enforce 
any kind of uh, you know, formal trials after the drug's approved is, is uh, substantially reduced. And in fact, a lot of, uh, of you know, necessary follow-on studies aren't done. So I do think what we, I think it comes down to the data. I think that we need to be doing more research um, uh, you know, uh, on, on drugs to show that they work. Um, if, uh, you know, we need to also be flexible. If a drug is, you know, if, it, if it's really an outcome that's 20 years down the road, you know, for like Alzheimer's disease or something like that, then we, you know, need to be searching for um, effective surrogate measures. But when we use those surrogate measures, we then need to do um, the appropriate trials after approval so that we, we, we circle back. And so, you know, even though the cholesterol lowering statin drugs um, are extremely effective, and we know that because, and, and they also lower your cholesterol, then the, the CETP inhibitors uh, that Anil mentioned aren't effective. And so there are two different drugs, they affect the same mechanism, but one, one works and one doesn't. And so we need to do right. that, that, that data. And I, so I want to go out the, to, uh, no, just, yeah. I just, I just want to emphasize that we, we need to do those post-approval studies, right. and right now, uh, drug companies are not doing them. Real quick, biology Greg. is very, human biology is very complicated. Greg. So, so just so that you understand the other side of the surrogate endpoint issue, is that surrogate endpoints were actually thought to be a brilliant idea mm. to actually get drugs to market sooner. That is, if you could, for example, uh, I think they're used in Good HIV point. quite frequently, right. which is that if you can show that the viral load is going down with your drug. Or the CD4 count. Right. Is that going is up. a surrogate endpoint because the real endpoint you care about is does the patient get uh, full blown AIDS and do they have mm -hmm. a longer life expectancy? But those drugs, if you waited for that, that drug would be. Uh, some five or ten years getting approved as opposed years. to, or longer, <laughs> as opposed to using the surrogate endpoint. So, I mean, I can remember having an exchange with Janet Woodcock some 20 years ago about surrogate endpoints when it was mm -hmm. sort of a novel concept that we could perhaps use something other than the gold standard endpoint of death for cancer and things like that. And so we're now using these other things. But yes, with Aaron, as with Aaron says, even when FDA has the fortitude to withdraw an approval, mm -hmm. That does not solve the pricing issue because then the patient advocacy groups are going to say, no, 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 no. We have these anecdotal stories that say it still works. You still need to pay for it or we're going to protest. And there are examples of that in the marketplace. So, so my question is, should we be paying less for drugs if they're approved on the basis of surrogate measures than if they're paying for not? And I also want to correct myself. Drug companies are not not doing these studies. It's just that a lot of them are delayed and they, they should be being done uh, in a more rigorous way. Right. But I think, I think there's a really good question about whether or not drug prices for drugs that are only shown to affect a surrogate measure until we know whether or not they actually do affect prices just, should, just be, should be paid Just real short form here. I'm going to yeah. ask one final question before I go to the audience. Sorry, but, Nula. But before that, uh, oh, no, one, real, one real thing. Real short, yeah. No, real short. But then there are these people who are saying drugs should get fast to people faster. And well, that's what I want to ask. I so, want to ask this question that right now, you feel a building momentum. I interviewed Congressman Peter Welch from Vermont the other day who's working on, on this FAST Act, on Generics Act, working on in the biosimilars mm -hmm. side of, of, of trying to get data shared between biotech firms and their, and, and their potential follow-on generics, trying to do these things that speed up the system. And Aaron, I, I think you have a lot of concerns about that. And I'm just interested, just before we go out, just real short mm -hmm. form, do you think that the, uh, that, that the system is helped or hurt by legislation that tries to speed things up on, on, on drug approvals? Um, I think that the system is helped in the circumstance of, uh, of trying to get um, generic drugs on the market uh, sooner because, uh, you know, and, and getting more generic uh, alternatives out there because generic prices are lower and biosimilars because generic prices um, are low when there is sufficient competition. I think that there can be substantial problems, and I don't just think this, there is actual data that um, when uh, brand name drugs are approved right. on a more expedited pa uh, uh, system, there are subsequent greater uh, safety risks and other problems associated with them. Now, we want, might want to, that might be an appropriate trade-off if the brand name drug is for you know, some kind of serious medical condition or unmet medical need. But in many cases, we are expediting drugs to market that are not in those, in those, uh, in those kinds of categories. And so you think it's a, it's a, it's a qualified response? A qualified really? response. Um, I, and I think, I think we don't know. So some surrogate markers work brilliantly, and some don't. So, and I think you know, we don't know what that percent is. So in some cases, we'll be heroes for having gotten it out quickly, and we'll be villains for having gotten it out quickly. So would we you don't support know. Welch's and, and Elijah Cummings? Um, I, I would go with the doing it for drugs where there is no other option or people who are at the end stage, because then in that case, the 
uh, it's right. worth a try. Gregory? I'm saying we already do that. That is mm -hmm. the That's reason. You're saying it's unnecessary. The re no, no, I'm, I wouldn't even go that far. But, but I think the reason that uh, you find investment money going into cancer, cancer drugs right. is because those drugs do have a shorter path to approval. The patients are in relatively desperate situations. They don't care about some of the niceties of the side effects because they really want the cancer cured. So we already, that's why the investment is going there. So we're already doing that to some extent. Mm. What the, I assume what they're proposing is that we do this in a more broad scale a broad way. way. Mm. That, for example, if, if it's a drug that is gonna be widely used, for example, for hypertension, diabetes, that could be a real mistake because the side effects are not going to be known in a small study. If you think about it, most drugs are tested on f way fewer than 5,000 patients. But there are some very, very bad things that occur, one in 10,000 patients. Mm. Uh, and so when you start giving a drug on, to a lot of on people- on rare yes. diseases, this yes. where it, it, aside from cancer, right. on rare diseases where people are missing some key uh, metabolic enzymes for, for to key to life, Right. We might be making that, and then we didn't ever talk about the Rare Disease Act, but that's right. another. Well, right. I'm sure we didn't cover it all, but I guarantee we covered a lot. <laughs> uh, but let me open up the, the floor now. We've got Here tons we go. of questions, so we're going to go lightning questions, lightning round, try and do as many as we can. The, uh, this gentleman in the white, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just do some quick loops here. Hi, I'm, I'm a physician. Hi. And one thing I, I, we didn't discuss is the advertising on TV. Advertising. I mean, I, I, as I understand, there aren't many countries in the world that allow pharmaceuticals to advertise on TV. I don't know how Who? many. New Zealand. Interesting okay. question. <laughs> and New Zealand so and the US. I've had people coming to me all the time. And this, just one other quick yeah. thing, if you can discuss, whatever happened to Medicare negotiating with Right, Medicare D, prices? Which, which I should have, it was my next yeah. point, but I was running out of time. So Medicare, let, let's take a question, you know, a few questions together. Yes, right. I have a question, I think, perhaps for Aaron, and that is, I'd like to understand the role of patient advocacy organizations. Right. Like, do they help expedite um, orphan drug approvals, and to what extent is pharma funding them? Great, uh, And therefore, like, we're, there's got to be an ethical dilemma in there somewhere. And let's go to the lady in the right here. <laughs> or there are two ladies on the right. We'll get both of you here. Yes. Hi, Denise Clayton. I'm a health economist at RTI International. Hi. And I'd just like to get the panelist's opinion on the future of value-based drug payments. Uh, it seems to be kind of a hot area. We've done some work here, but sometimes there are a lot of hurdles and just wanted to know what you think about our ability to Well, as an economist, do you, see, do you see it as promising or do you see it as foolish? Get I up think here. I think it has a role, absolutely. <laughs> so far, the, you know, the um, arrangements that we've seen seem to be for drugs that have a weaker market position going wow. into it. So there's definitely a role, but I'm wondering if for better drugs, you know, there might be a role as well. Interesting. And then because I cut you off, I'm going to take you there. No, no, no we'll, we'll do it. I mean, they've got a lot to say, and I'm going to get them to no, jumble it up is, into this package. This is a quick one. You yeah. asked about the bad actors, Shkreli and right. Valiant, and we sort of got sidetracked. Quick question. For a drug that's been on the market 30 years, was an orphan drug, goes to a small population, costs $50,000. Orphan drug hijacking. Yeah, orphan drug hijacking, drugs that have been around 30 years. How do we... That seems to be to be a very easy thing to fix. That a drug that costs a right. dollar to make, it's been around forever. How do we fix that? It Great. seems so. Thank you. So we'll, we'll come back to all of you in a second. But let's, for the first question is advertising. Mm -hmm. Is that a big driver? Yeah. And so I mean, I think the the bigger driver in terms of of spent unnecessary spending on high cost drugs is advertising to physicians, which as opposed to the four billion dollars or so a year we spend on direct to consumer advertising is more like fifty or sixty billion dollars a year. But nonetheless, direct to consumer advertising uh, does uh, drive. Uh, patients to ask about high cost drugs because the only advertisements you see on television are for high cost drugs because generic drugs don't advertise. There's no um, financial incentive for them to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and it tends to also be for drugs that, you know, m you know a really important or really new drug would sell itself. Why would right. you need to have an advertisement on, on these, uh, you know, six o'clock news um, for in, the, in those kinds of circumstances? Anyway, so mm -hmm. um, I do think that, that um, uh, drug advertising on television uh, does drive uh, spending on, um, on, on brand name drugs in many cases um, when there are lower cost uh, or generic drugs available. 
Um, I don't think there is much we can do about it, though. Thank you. Uh, Greg and Anula, this question on Medicare D. And I was looking at the data. It says today we spent $103 billion in that, in that category. It's projected in 2025 to go to $216 billion. Uh, and it is, uh, uh, they're arguing 15 to $16 billion of health value lost in the inability to negotiate on that front. I don't understand. I mean, I'm not an, an expert in that. Why don't we allow uh, Medicare to negotiate well, those it's prices? A, it's a legal, it was part of the. Part of the, the deal? Deal. It's part of the deal. Now, yeah. let's, let's understand. Put in the law by so, the um, it's a law. What's that? There it's is a law. It was put in the law by the drug industry. By the drug yeah. well, they lobbied for it. They lobbied for it. OK, uh, but it is a, uh, we have to decide, do we want that? Because you know, most people will say, and Aaron uses the term a few times, monopolist. We don't like monopolists, even though what we, Eric, Aaron's really talking about are people with patents. But we also don't like monopsonists, that is the single purchaser, because a single purchaser can set price as easily as a single uh, manufacturer. And the government, while it is not the only purchaser in the US, it is a big enough purchaser to be able to basically make this no longer a free market. And, and there are people who think free market is inherently good. You can take a different view. But if you're going to take the position that monopolies, which are bad from an antitrust perspective, then we need to be at least consistent on the monopsonist side. Uh, that is, that's not the answer, but at least no, but that starts the conversation. So I agree with you, because it's either we decide that the free market is the right mechanism for healthcare, or we don't. Mm -hmm. And I happen to think it doesn't work, but, but we seem to be Stuck inconsistent. In exactly. Stuck in, this case, in the middle. In this case, we're talking about the government, right? We're not talking about private actors banding together to be. No, I mean, but we're I, talking but about I, a, government, I a government purchasing. So it's. it's, it's but, but I think that it, it shouldn't we're be. We're going to go short government. form, guys, because we don't have much no, time. But Aaron's point yeah. is important. The government is exempt from antitrust rules, but that doesn't mean that they can't basically make the market less free. Right. Great. Yes. Aaron, patient advocacy, um, are they just a, a front for pharma, or no. do they do good things? They do good things. Um, there are a lot of patient advocacy groups that are paid by pharmaceutical companies and, and, have, and have a lot of conflicts of interest, and I think that there needs to be more transparency around those things. I think there's a really important role for patient advocacy groups in, um, in, in, the, in the healthcare sector, in the pharmaceutical market, in, in interacting with the FDA. I think that that can be very yeah. healthy, um, but I think it is also the case that, uh, that we need to be very clear about uh, the conflicts of interest that exist, and, and these, things, uh, these kinds of conflicts have gone um, un, unreported um, and undiscussed uh, and are now uh, being uh, discussed a little bit further. I think there was a study um, recently published, uh, a survey recently published in JAMA looking at, at, at patient advocacy groups right. suggesting that the majority of them have substantial financial ties to pharmaceutical companies. And I think that hopefully those, those patient advocacy groups are looking at those ties themselves and wondering you know, how that changes their uh, what they're ask, asking for in their advocacy. But I think that at the end of the day, you know, it is right. really important to keep, to keep the patient voice involved in this, and patient thank, advocacy thank groups and are really important to do thank that. Thank you. Anula, on, on this value price modeling, on this value-based price that, that, that we ask, I, I think if I understood your price, you said, you know, weaker sort of newer entry uh, 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 products are, are, are more into that. You're asking sort of more incumbents more uh, uh, strong drug participation. So, so Do you it, think there's something in there? My, in a life long time ago, I was a health economist at Roche. Um, and, and I think that that is a, a good model mm. and that it should be there. I'm not sure it's going to endure right. in the current situation. Um, I also want to say the poster uh, child for advocacy was the HIV time. And I was mm. the head for um, HIV drugs at right. Roche. And, and they transformed. Uh, the regulatory landscape and the industry oh. landscape. Orphan drug hijacking. Mm -hmm. um, it, is it easy to stop? I think it's hard. Let's, mm. Can we just discuss this a bit? Uh, the first issue uh, on the general issue of old drugs that are getting some sort of approval, uh, there were a large, large number. There were more than 100 uh, drugs on the market that had never uh, been approved under the post-62 system. And so what happened, and Colchicine is an example, and there are probably some others mm -hmm. out there, is that FDA said, OK, these drugs need to come off the market or you demonstrate that you are safe and effective. So once those drugs demonstrate that they're safe and effective, then all of a sudden they get the benefits of a new drug having been demonstrated safe and effective. So mm -hmm. in most cases, they got three years. But if they were an orphan drug, that is something that's designed for a small market, they also got the benefit that a new drug would get for a small market. So they would get the seven years. So how do you stop that? Well, first thing, 
this is going to be a short-lived problem because most of those drugs are going to either get approved or they're going right. to be taken off the market. But there is, I am not in any way defending uh, Shkreli and folks like that because there are people who have as their business model to go after these old drugs and basically rescue them and then jack up the price. The issue I don't think is that you rescue them, that you get some exclusivity and that you charge more. The question is, do you charge that much more? Do you go from what I think it was in his case? Uh, but, there, but there's a tension okay, so. between what's legally possible and what's morally right. Exactly, right? but it's not, I mean, a, a drug that might, for example, and I'm not even sure I've got his numbers right, go but there was Aaron one on drug that. that went $5 to $1,400. Right. And, and the question is, well, it's not that the price went up that's immoral, it's right. how much it might have gone up real and quick. what it's used for. So, I mean, that's a different issue. Aaron, real quick, I know you. I mean, morality is, I mean, these are, these are for-profit companies. Their, their first responsibility is to their shareholders, and they, and you know, if, they've, if they notice a, a market failure, so your view is never then, trust then I mean, yeah. but I think that, I think the issue is, is that as, you know, from, from a public policy point of view, then we need to do something about it. And so what do we need to do about it? These are old drugs, they're not protected by patents. A lot of them have manufacturers that are selling the drug in other countries that are not approved in the US. Right. We should look to those other countries. The second issue is that the government can get involved and act as a purchaser and set a purchase price and say, look, we're going to buy a lot of this product and we're gonna set a, a, a set price for it over the next five years. And that will bring other, uh, and that will incentivize other companies to try to gear into the market. And what we need is we need more competition in the market to try to lower these prices. Thank you for that, that's great. So we're gonna do two, just two or three quick because we're right near the end, right here. And thank you to whoever's running the mic. I know I'm running you all so over the place. So I've got a weird perspective on this. On this. I, I, I've helped run PBMs and run managed care. Sure. My sister died of cystic fibrosis and I've helped biotech companies. Right. We're not talking about the thing we need to talk about. 70% of the drug price inflation in the last 10 years have been not on these complex molecules. It's been the bold, sustained, rapacious greed where big pharma has wildly overstepped. So we've got pills that cost $1,000 a pill. 15 US, seconds. $4 in India. Insulin's yeah. gone up 160% right. in the last five years. The, 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 the creation cost $2 in right. 1921. How do you justify that? Uh -huh. Thank you. Yes, right here. Well, just a question as, as a consumer, um, what kind of consumer education might help some of these problems, like mm -hmm. advising, for example, people not to even listen to ads on the television, advising people, um, the, the questions them. to ask doctors mm -hmm. like about efficacy of I drugs and things that. like that. Great, thank you. I want to take one last one of this uh, right here. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll have a great after session. You can all come up. Right, right here, this gentleman, yeah. Uh, my question is more just in context. Uh, it, it seems that pharmaceuticals is an easy target to, to fault our healthcare system. If you were to disengorge the pharmaceutical companies in America of their excess profits or all their profits, would we get that much closer to the cost per capita of healthcare that France or Germany or the UK? Great question. Has? So wonderful question. I'm going to end. We're going to you know bring this here as we end. So one greed is that is that is 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 you know when you look at it. I I appreciate your assertion. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't disagree from that. But just as I've looked at the data and biologics and where profits are, and you look at the weight of the of the you know pharmaceutical pricing uh, over time, which I was reading an Aaron study about 17 percent of the economy. So you got to look at that. So 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 I just want to ask you to, to respond on the sure. greed factor. Um, and I know you want to talk about the. Uh, consumer literacy, and I would oppose health literacy generally and, so, and what so can be done at front. But, but let me ask Aaron to go first, yeah. Sure, so pharmaceuticals make up about 17% of, uh, of healthcare spending and now 19% of employer-sponsored benefits. So yeah, there are, other, there are other things that we can talk about as being you know, uh, unnecessary healthcare spending at hospital levels and right. you know, unnecessary spending in ICUs and unnecessary uh, spending on, on specialist care or this and that. This panel is on drugs and they make up about a fifth uh, of, the, of the spending, and so if we were to you know, rein in drug costs, it would lead to a substantial reduction in, in healthcare spending. Would it, would it totally solve all of our problems? No. Um, and, and of course, nobody's talking about taking away um, profits totally, and I, I, think that, I think it's just a matter of trying to bring the misalignment mm -hmm. um, that we're seeing um, back into alignment. So uh, I think it is a systemic problem. And I would advise you to, I have no affiliation with this at all, but I would read Elizabeth Rosenthal's American Sickness. Mm -hmm. It's a great book, and she goes through not just drugs, she goes through the whole system, but she addresses drugs as well. 
and, and it's an easy to read book, and I would recommend it. I, I, I just would say, from, from Chair's prerogative, I think health literacy generally in the United States is just abhorrently all low. All kinds of literacy. And, and uh, you know, all kinds of literacy, but in that area, uh, whether it's on consumer issues or not, but, but that's another topic for another day. But I do, I do agree. I've done forums in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, on obesity, looking at chronic health conditions in various places that, that people can put under the control. And so when you start there where the need is great and the costs of that are very high, you wonder about literacy not being something we push more uh, than, than but, I feel that we're pushing. Very specifically, so, yeah. we should tell patients to ask their physicians how much drugs cost and have right. conversations about costs with their physicians. Physicians often don't know. Because physicians right. don't know and physicians so don't think it's within their issue as Physicians well. don't, don't think it's within their job know. to ask. And right. physicians, it is, know. but it is part of the conversation because, mm -hmm. you know, a drug might be very useful, but if a patient can't afford it and if a patient doesn't take it, then it's not going to have any right. effect. And Gregory, in this last question as well, in addition to whatever else, you know, farm, you know pharmaceutical firms, the face of some of these problems, if you were to get, again, I just want, as we end this conversation today, in getting the equities better aligned, better put into place, do you have any big thoughts at the moment you want to hit out of the park on, on getting that equation and the equities and the various actors and stakeholders in our health equation right? If it's not just pharmaceutical companies and you were to kind of you know, deal with, with getting it in greater balance. Bring so, us home, Greg. <laughs> bring us home. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of, of, a lot of optimism here because the, these Thank you for that. <laughs> no, no, the, the players operate in different silos with different incentives on the very same issues. And so that is a problem. And I think that's why there are people on NOLA, I don't, I don't, among them who say that you don't get this solved until there is one person who's basically dealing with it, or basically you've got a single player trying to deal with all pieces of the puzzle. Because as long as you, you look at a, the pharmaceutical industry, which is basically a vendor to the main system, a vendor to hospitals, a vendor to patients, a vendor to doctors, and, and, and the, the pharmaceutical industry doesn't have a play in all of that, then you don't have one entity saying, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. Now, what could you do? If you had a very powerful, who knows what, czar, to say, this drug has been approved, but you should not use it because it does not work, or this drug, this advertisement is on TV, but what they're really trying to sell you is X. Don't do it. But no one can take, no one is willing to take that position, and there is waste in terms of physicians not also being as uh, uh, as rigorous about what they should be using, what they should not be using. One of the things that sometimes happens: physicians get on a drug, they keep using the drug, they don't like to change the drug. That's not what you want. You want people to be immensely educated, real time, doing what they're supposed to do. There's so many things there, but all I would say is that uh, because we're in different silos, it's going to be a problem for a while. I just want to say as we bring this to a close, thank the three of you. I mean, this is a consequential discussion. It's a very big one. I didn't know where we were necessarily going to go, but we did, <laughs> we did, we did cover, uh, yeah, cover quite a bit of uh, topics, and I appreciate the different perspectives each of you brought to this. So I want to thank you very much. Please give a round of applause to Gregory Glover, Anula Jasiorea, and Aaron Kesselheim. Thank you very, very much for your thoughts. Thank all of you.